Hello and welcome on this new edition of Prime Time Watchmaking in the News. And November has definitely been a busy month. Uh, plenty of watchmaking events here and there, uh, auctions, uh, award ceremony, business news, a Basel World Shocker, well, you name it, but also quite a lot of uh, product announcements as brands try to occupy more and more the grounds uh, prior to the SIH by preparing our mind to what will be officially launched in mid uh, January. So, this started for some of these brands already in September. September. Yeah, that's an early start. And of course, they won't unveil everything. There's a lot of uh, teasing going on. And the climax, uh, so to say, should remain the actual event itself, uh, with the most this, the most that. It's a tactic we've seen uh, developing strong and strong over the years by most of the Richmond brands. Independent brands uh, tend to wait a bit more until the event. But of course, uh, for these two, uh, we've heard a few unofficial stories, even seen a few things. But you know our legendary Swiss secrecy tradition, so I'll simply shut up apart from AP, who invited us to see a few things, and therefore I will talk about it. So, uh, we'll discover all these new timepieces in the flesh together in a few weeks, and we'll do so with a special one of you, since we've selected the guy or girl that will accompany us and give us a hand for this SIHH. But there too, I won't say anything. You'll also discover this uh, special Watches TV VVIP guest on the very first day, uh, among some other cool surprises we have waiting for you. And boy, if I'm happy uh, of how how things are developing and boy if I want to make you happier and happier with our car rates. So anyhow, before talking about the products, just wanted to say that I will come back on this uh, brand teasing tactic uh, mentioned before because it has a direct link with that uh, Basel World shocker I will explain in a very short while. So let's now talk uh, products and you guys uh, saw, for instance, the new GMT line uh, in the overseas collection of Bacheron Constantin, something we covered in our uh, Dubai Watch Week uh, video report, as well as the new uh, complete calendar in the tra traditional collection. Well, these were a fine example of this pre-SIHH uh, thing uh, going on. Uh, but IWC also just announced that uh, for the 150th anniversary of the brand in 2018, it will unveil 27 limited editions during the Geneva event, uh, ranging from the Portuguese collection to the Portofino, Pilot and Da Vinci. Remember Da Vinci, the code of beauty. Can't really get over that one. Still gets me going. But IWC will especially present for the very first time a digital display wristwatch working with uh, three rotating discs, uh, one for the hours and two for the minutes. Uh, I mean the decimal and the, the, the minute hand, and uh, normal trading uh, small second at 6 o'clock. I mean this red gold case watch uh, pays tributes to the Pal Weber pocket watch of 1884 and will be limited to 250 pieces. Looks pretty nice and elegant, but it's always pretty hard to judge on photos and uh, we'll wait for the SIH uh, for this. I'm pretty sure that uh, for such a significant anniversary date, well, uh, we should be in for some other special kind of uber timepiece would be worthy of IWC and their history and maybe there might even be a few, who knows? So still in the anniversary mood, Audemars Piguet presented a lim limited edition uh, celebrating the 25th anniversary of the Royal Oak Offshore. And this I saw in the flesh. So this new Royal Oak Offshore tourbillon chronograph comes in either a 45 mm steel or rose gold case. That's a new size for the offshore. It also uh, presents an evolution of an existing movement, but the architecture has been seriously redefined as to accentuate this uh, 3D-like uh, impression with a rather disruptive approach to the notion of open work, especially with these uh, bridges, which seem to be, uh, I mean, kind of holding the sapphire glass, but that's uh, only an optical illusion, in fact. So I know you uh, first need to master the rules to break them. I quite like this slogan, pretty efficient. But I do question myself about this reinterpretation. Well, maybe I will get uh, used to it, or maybe I'm just too old-fashioned. Especially that at the, at the same time, AP re-edited a limited edition of the original Offshore with some uh, small changes, and the contrast is obviously quite apparent, uh, apparent between the two. So, okay. I will see it again at the SIH and will tell you what I think there. But I guess it's also a way for AP to test how they can make their product line evolve because when you have a killer product like the Royal Oak in your catalog, well, not too easy to reinvent uh, oneself without uh, risking some kind of controversy. I mean, think of Rolex. So for those of you who haven't seen it, we also showed you the first full working model of the DR01 from Master Watchmaker, 
Dominique Renault, a timepiece with an incredible uh, blade resonator system replacing the traditional balance wheel. Still a lot of development to be made before we'll see this uh, produced in the hundreds, but the proof of concept has been made, so already quite an important step not only for Dominique Renault, but also simply for the ever ongoing evolution of mechanical watchmaking. And on that matter, 2017 has been pretty dense and full of extraordinary accomplishments when you think about it. I mean, the Agengraf, the first truly significant significant evolution of the chronograph developed by uh, Jean-Marc Biderecht and his team of Agenor. I mean, with this, you know, central uh, indicator display, an instant uh, jumping minute and uh, hour marker. I mean, a totally new uh, architecture and approach. Seven years of development and uh, then we, uh, what about, I mean, the Semon regulator from the LVMH uh, Science Institute, introduced uh, for the first time in that uh, Zenith uh, DeFi lab. I mean, a single component replacing the, the minimum 31 components found in a traditional escape and balance wheel uh, mechanism uh, thanks to this transposition of compliant mechanics uh, principles in watchmaking. Who said it was boring? And even those, uh, these breakthroughs are fresh out of the lab or other workshops, and only time will tell how indeed impactful, reliable, economically feasible these breakthroughs are. But it just prove, uh, proves once again that we're still in for some, some surprises in the years to come. I personally hate to hear these catchwords like uh, when innovation meets tradition. Everyone says it. Uh, it's just like, this is the DNA of the brand. Okay, I totally understand what they mean. It's indeed pretty explicit. But when you've heard them over and over again from these marketing teams, I promise you that it ha unfortunately has this kind of yikes effect on me. But okay, uh, yes, I'm all in for tradition and respect of where we come from. And I think I've made this pretty evident on this channel, but I have uh, nothing against trying stuff. And with the evolution of technology, the development of raw uh, processing power, it's normal that it can and should be applied to watchmaking. It's not a dead art. I mean, we've gone from prehistoric painting seen uh, in caves to figurative painting of the Renaissance to impressionism to cubism and abstract painting. And it all remains painting. Sometimes, I mean, with some poorly executed paintings of the Renaissance and other impression, impressionistic failures to some other masterpieces and so on. I mean, with today people liking one style more than the other, and it's all fine. And this can be said about mechanical watchmaking. And that's where I would draw the line between a painting as an ensemble and let's say photocopies, uh, i.e. the quartz watch or the smart watch, uh, uh, if you see my thinking. But I still think that photocopies are very useful. Okay. I will stop there, but I guess that you get my point and let's now go back on track with this prime time. And before a cool surprise, yeah, because it's soon Christmas, well, I just wanted to say uh, how touched I've been uh, by the many guys that have now pledged a little something on our Patreon campaign. I mean, this is truly incredible and I believe a real game changer for us. I know that I set the bar uh, pretty high with our goal of having 1,000 patrons. So, so far we're getting close to 10% of this objective. So, but in such a short period of time, I mean, that's just really fantastic and we can't thank you enough for it. I mean, of course, I hope it doesn't stop there, uh, but you know my enthusiasm and positive spirit spirit and to mark a like kind of a sincere token of appreciation I have a very cool announcement for those that are pledging uh, five bucks or more per month because you will automatically participate in a lucky draw and the prize is this very cool uh, toolkit from our friends of Bergeon. Uh, we will make the draw on the 18th of December so we can uh, immediately ship uh, you uh, your Christmas present and please uh, I mean don't destroy your watch with it but to change your straps and do some basic things I mean this is really a cool kit. So if you want to participate, well, uh, you know uh, what to do. Patreon, Patreon. Yes, I know uh, it sounds like a bit of propaganda, but very importantly, I also wanted to tell you that the first thing I want to implement with this Patreon thingy is to be able to finance the translation and subtitles uh, of our videos. I mean, uh, the goal is really to open even further our community. So English is nice, but clearly not enough. And there are plenty of guys out there that I think would enjoy our videos if we could provide these subtitles in various languages. So I try as much as I can to do this, uh, you know, captioning uh, thing in English. I know it's not always the case and uh, I would already, I mean, it would already be a good start uh, uh, if I did so. So I promise to do that from now on. But if any of you guys have any solutions to make this translation happen, well, I'm totally open. And of course, there will be a budget available and we don't need to start with all languages at the same time. Step by step is fine. So in the meantime, I did my little research and contacted various 
translation companies, I have a pretty good idea of the costs involved per language. But I must admit, I would much prefer that if we need to pay something, well, that if it stays within our little community, it's much better. It goes without saying that it needs to be serious and uh, thorough. Quality is you know, non-negotiable. And the goal is really to share accurately to these new potential audiences our love and passion for watchmaking. And regarding languages, well, I think Spanish, German, Russian, Portuguese, Korean could be good starts. Well, you make the suggestions and we'll take it from there. Again, uh, this idea of using these contributions to go back uh, to the community, I mean, that really inspires me and hopefully uh, can only make our watch lover family bigger and stronger and uh, in this case bigger is better. What you give here goes back there. That's really nice. And this is the perfect transition uh, for me to say that uh, for some smaller is better but not, that, not necessarily because they desired it. Uh, so off we go with this Basel shocker I kept uh, waiting you for. So because a few days ago we received a rather strange uh, press release that I had to read three times to be sure I was not hallucinating. In a matter of a few years the number of exhibitors slowly declined from over 2,000 exhibitors in 2011 to 1,500 in 2016 and an impressive drop of 300 less in 2070. Well next year the downfall is seriously brutal and there will be in total between 600 to 700 exhibitors expected in 2000. 2018. Yes, you heard me right. So the politically correct uh, answer disclosed by the organizer is that they want to focus on quality and make this event uh, really special. Okay, that's uh, for the facade and we all love it. But it really reflects a shift uh, we've been talking about unfortunately too many times here. Just as brands uh, were continuously increasing their prices for often very questionable reasons, apart from bigger profit mar mar margins and ludicrous marketing budgets, okay, sometimes also they invested in massive production uh, solutions. Well, one can say that Basel World followed a bit down that route. Everything was too easy in a certain way uh, in those good old days. So, of course, they also invested huge amounts of money in developing these new hosting facilities designed by the famous Swiss and Basel-based uh, Basel architect duo Herzog and Demeron. These are the guys behind the modern Tate Gallery in London, the new concert hall of Hamburg, the future uh, stadium of Chelsea, uh, this uh, spectacular Jenga-like tower in New York. Well, all, all extraordinary example of incredible architecture and yes, originally I wanted to be an architect. Well, not only did this come at a cost, but unfortunately one has to say that everybody tried to profit a bit too much with the Basel Fair. When we go there, we always rent a big apartment for the team and our post-production uh, outfit and needless to say that the price of the rental is ridiculously high. I mean, for a week we probably pay uh, two months of normal rent. Hotel rates uh, triple. If you're looking for an Airbnb, locals go totally crazy. The prices on restaurant menus magically increase during the event. So for many brands, retailers and journalists, it's become a real luxury to attend and it's not really needed anymore. Well, all this could uh, only go that far and opportunism has its limits and here too the elastic has snapped. And you know what, but quite a lot of brands were already telling me a few years ago that it would be, uh, be cheaper for them to invite and fly all their retailers to the Bahamas or some other cool destination for a few days, share some serious you know, bonding and business of course, instead of attending uh, Basel. So I guess unfortunately nobody really listened and that's uh, what some of the brand uh, will now do, you know, just fly away. But in all honesty, this is not the only reason why all this is happening. I mean, things have changed, the world has changed, the way we communicate and do business has changed. I mean, the rise of social media that needs constant uh, feeding uh, partially changed the rules. The just-in-time production methods adopted in the automotive industry are gently coming to watchmaking. Retailers used to come to Basel World from all over the world, discover uh, novelties there and do their yearly purchase on site. I mean, this has all changed. Uh, now there's more pressure on the retailers that, that can't make uh, any more those kind of uh, take this kind of financial risk of stocking up goods that if not sold could then end up on the gray market, something detrimental for the brands, but sometimes sadly created by them. So the rise of online purchase, well, all these elements question the precise reason of being of such events. And don't get me wrong, I mean, this can be said for the SISH too. So coming back to my opening statement and this teasing tactic, I mean, yes, it is a necessary tactic 
tactic because as a brand, you need to occupy the communication field and not uh, once a year, but throughout the year. You need to distill your products and keep the continuous interest in the brand. And the only ones that can more or less get away with this are brands like Rolex and Patek Philippe that will continue to show all their novelties during the single event. But those are powerhouses and, and uh, in a league of their own. But even so, I wouldn't be surprised that sooner or later, they will also adapt and be present with novelties introduced here and there. But again, I mean, these two houses have a very different relation uh, with their retailers as a recognized partner of their success. So, okay, I could go on and on with this, but uh, what I really want to say is that the meaning and purpose of such event has changed and therefore they need to propose something different. The SIGH opening its door on the final day is a good example. Brands need to connect uh, with the final customer and that's why events around the world have their meaningfulness. They don't have uh, necessarily need to be copies of the SIH. I mean, simplicity can work for a lot of people, I believe, even though we're still talking about uh, you know, the luxury business. So anyhow, this transition of Basel World is a very interesting one. And you know what? I think that we will be direct uh, actors or participating in it because I give you a little scoop and we will be physically present in it and I really mean in it with our own booth and again I really want to involve you with this but I will come back on this I mean soon uh, count on me so again one uh, step at a time for us but I still think that you know Basel World is a magical moment and apart from some negatives expressed before I love Basel World and I think that we're going to have a blast there it should be all about experience and we're going to take it to the next level thanks to you so Basel World plus watches TV sounds pretty cool to me. I mean, most of, uh, of the brands we love will still be there, so no worries in terms of great contents and encounters to be made. And again, thanks to you. One last thing, and this concerns uh, the GPHG, the main uh, award ceremony of the watch uh, industry, and uh, which took place in early November. And I have an idea I want to throw out like this. I mean, I like this event, the industry totally deserves it. But uh, like I uh, already said a few times, uh, one of its major flaws uh, is that it doesn't reflect all the watches introduced during that year. Only the watches of brands willing to participate, so no Pateks, no Rolex, almost no Richmond Group brands, pra practically no Swatch Group. I mean, that's quite a lot of big names that uh, are not on the ballot. But yes, there are nevertheless quite a lot of watches in competition. Okay, so that's the number one reason. But the reason number two is that the average price of winning watches is simply crazily high. I mean, we're talking approximately 250,000 uh, US dollars on average. I mean, uh, I can't really understand either how in the same category you uh, can have such uh, price gaps. Look at this year in the calendar category. Of course, the, I mean, the Grover Force had to win. It's an amazing timepiece. It's a masterpiece. Uh, I'm fully in love with it. But how on earth can it even be compared to a Zenith El Primero big date? And, and I'm not being disrespectful to Zenith, but you, I mean, you get my point. So I seriously think that we, meaning you and the Watchers TV, uh, we should start our own award. I mean, this idea really excites me. Yes yet another one and yes I don't sleep too well or let's say that the thinking machine is always on on so what do you think of this and actually I'm open to your comments and suggestions but I really think there's something to be done which involves this community and for the main uh, upcoming things of December it will be uh, interesting to see after the crazy Paul Newman Paul Newman Rolex Daytona record of approximately 18 million dollars fetched at the Philips auction well we'll see what the Patek Philippe reference uh, 130 belonging to American sports legend Joe DiMaggio will fetch at the next uh, New York uh, Christie's auction. We'll keep you posted on that one. And to close this edition, I still have good news as our next uh, who's who of watchmaking will precisely concern Patek Philippe. Yes, I told you we're in a Christmas uh, mood too. And if you want to win that toolbox, you also know what you need to do. And now I will seriously shut up. I initially thought that this, uh, this edition of Prime Time would be short. Well, I guess I kind of slipped a little bit. So viva watchmaking, viva Patreon, and all the best to you. See you real soon.